Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, Professor Thais. Uh, welcome to our webinar on human space exploration, challenges and achievements. For our webinar, we have a special guest speaker, Professor Thais Usumanu, MD, PhD. Before I uh, pass the floor to Professor Thais, uh, let me talk a little bit about our webinar. First of all, my name is Sujong Ko. I am founding partner of Golden Oak Consulting, uh, which is an international consulting firm. We focus a lot on Asia and Latin America. So let me talk about our webinar. Webinar Human Space Exploration, Challenge and Achievements. The presence of gravity on Earth has shaped the development of humankind over billions of years. But what happens to our anatomy and physiology when this force is removed? Exposure to microgravity affects the entire body, causing numerous changes such as a reduction in heart size and blood volume, disturbances of the neurological system, decreases in bone and muscle mass, and immune function impairment. Psychological reactions to the hostile environment of space can also have a significant impact on operational activities and safety, especially considering long duration missions. Welcome to our journey into human space exploration webinar, raising your awareness of and understanding of the problems to be overcome if humans are to remain in space for longer, develop and work on moon bases or even colonize Mars. Further, consider the likely exponential growth in space tourism over the next decades, potentially exposing less fit and health to compromise individuals to the microgravity of space. Uh, this webinar is being organized by Innova Space sponsored by Golden Oak Consulting and BR Visa and supported by Keep Electric, Ibrei, Hamaum, Abecasa, Lucilla Arquiteta, Trade Energy, CQSFV Advogados. Um, so a little bit about Professor Thais Usomano, MD and PhD. Professor Thais is an Innova Space UK co-founder and CEO. Thais has more than 30 years of experience teaching and researching in the field of aerospace medicine, space physiology, aerospace biomedicine, aerospace biomedical engineering, and telehealth and digital health, including participation in more than 200 scientific events with more than 300 scientific papers presented. Thais has also authored books book chapters and numerous papers in her areas of expertise. Thais is an elected academician of the International Academy of Aviation and Space Medicine and the International Academy of Astronautics, for which she serves on the Board of Trustees and IAA Scientific and Publication and Communication Committees. She is also a member of International Association and Societies in Space aviation and telehealth, a board member of companies, reviewer for journals, and acts as a review editor and frontiers in space technologies, and further holds a patent related to space life sciences and aerospace biomedical engineering. Thais acted as a voluntary mentor for Space for Women, an initiative of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. So welcome, Thais, to our webinar. Uh, the floor is yours. Before you uh, start your, um, your lecture to us, uh, let me just advise everyone that this, be, this webinar is being recorded. So please, if you do, do not want to be on the video, just to turn off the video and uh, keep the microphone mute. We are going to record this webinar and upload on the channel and also share uh, on the social media and uh, by, send by email, okay? Uh, if you have any question, you can just uh, put the comments on the chat board 
And if you really want to talk to Thais, just to let me know so that I can also invite you to the uh, screen and we can also interact with each other. So our goal is to finalize this webinar uh, before um, 12.30 uh, p.m. Sao Paulo time and 3.30 p.m. London time. OK, so welcome again, um, the Professor Thais. Please start your lecture to us. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I hope you enjoy this journey into space. <laughs> and I will I will turn off my camera now. Just make sure that the presentation uh, does not have any issue. You never know the internet. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen well? Yes. OK. Oops. So my my idea is to present a bit of um, what are what are the challenges and the achievements, in fact, also that we we had over decades you now of human space exploration and also talk a bit about the role of Innova Space. My company was uh, mentioned by Sue uh, that I have here in the UK. So just very briefly, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time because we have the home page you know, dot, um, of Innova Space, which is um, uh, innovaspace.org. And uh, when I decided to create this, um, this uh, company, uh, I took all my my experience of decades you know, and tried to come up with something that would be a bit peculiar, let's say, a bit different from the majority of companies related to space. So our main, let's say, uh, philosophy is space without borders, which means that's not just geographic borders, but also language barriers or um, religious beliefs, um, any, any, anything, any any aspects of human life, you know, lives that could, let's say, create um, different groups, let's say. So for us, it's very important to be very global, very inclusive, create um, projects that um, welcomes diversity, that somehow are disruptive in terms of scientific projects and educational activities. And these, these two um, ideas, you know, scientific projects, educational initiatives, are basically uh, our two main pillars. We use that to create projects in four main areas. Uh, space, more dedicated to human space exploration, aviation medicine, uh, other extreme environments, so mountains or diving, things like that, and digital health telemedicine, because we believe that uh, in all these environments, it's very important to uh, provide some kind of health uh, care, no security to to the to, the, um, uh, to humans that are exploring these uh, environments that somehow are very hostile to our uh, physiology, you know, our well-being. So uh, the goal of Innova Space is to facilitate the creation of a globally inclusive and diverse network of professionals, researchers, entrepreneurs, and students led by the common team of human presence in space and other in, in these other uh, in extreme environments, as I mentioned. So we take all these, let's say, these four areas, and then we transform it in three ac actions, let's say. You know, that's how we interact with the public and with our partners. We have an area of um, research, innovation, entrepreneurship that we basically uh, work with other companies to develop products, to develop techniques, methods, process, that can be used in space and then also be applied here on Earth in, in one of the uh, areas of science. Plus, uh, the second area is education. That's basically for universe and, and um, research institutes. And the third one is outreach, which means like today, a webinar, talking to people, try to make this knowledge of space available to everyone. Could it be a school? Could it be a society? Could it be just a webinar open? to the public and other uh, education initiatives under the outreach that we have uh, with different countries. In fact, we have in, in Zimbabwe, we have in, 
in the Philippines, we have in El Salvador. So just showing some examples of how global we want to be. Now we want to re really make this knowledge very popular, let's say. We are humans going to an exit investor environment, and it's very important to go as a, as a whole species. You know, we are, uh, you are human, humanity, and all the projects have this uh, view. So let's um, understand a bit about human space exploration. And for that, we need to go back in time and go to 1961, 12 April, when uh, the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin went into space, you know, the, first, the first human to do that. And he was, uh, he had a short flight, you know, 108 minutes. So it was not um, even two hours, you know, but he could prove that uh, uh, we could go into space and be exposed to this extraterrestrial environment and come back safely. But that by that time, there was a list of possibilities of signs and symptoms that uh, Gagarin could uh, face during the flight and after the flight. And I just want to call attention to two of them here. Uh, one, for example, urinary retention and increased urinary flow. So you can see the opposite effects here, no? Uh, or hypertension and hypotension. So just to call the attention that by that stage, we, there was a huge lack of knowledge of um, related to the, how humans would react to the extraterrestrial environment. Uh, this is a slide that shows something that is very important. This is the, the, the let's say, the, the, the environment you know, the, that the astronaut is exposed to that changed a lot from the beginning of the uh, human space exploration, considering here the American space program, uh, to nowadays you know, that we have the ISS. And I just want to show you that some aspects are very important for the well-being and health of astronauts. Uh, for the first three projects, Mercury, Gemini and Apollo, we had very low uh, ambient pressure, so the atmospheric pressure was very low. And if, if you decrease the, atmos the atmospheric pressure, you have to increase the oxygen, so you avoid a lack of oxygen in your blood, which is called hypoxia. By the Skylab project, could see that the pressure was the same, 5 PSC, PSI, sorry, which is, is still very low. But the oxygen went down a bit, 70%, you know, from 170. And we, they, there was an introduction of nitrogen. So the first attempt here, uh, uh, this was sorry, the first attempt to create something more similar to our atmosphere, a combination of nitrogen and oxygen, but they were in the <laughs> they were in the reverse concentrations now. So with the advent of the space shuttle back in 1981, the first flight was exactly to 20 years after Gagarin, 12 April 1981. And nowadays with the ISS, we have a, a very similar, let's say, environment that you enjoy here on Earth. So the pressure is uh, 760 millimeters of mercury, which is 1 atm. It's what we have at sea level. Uh, the atmosphere you know, that you breathe in the inside of the ISS is 20% oxygen, 8% nitrogen, extremely equal to what we have here on Earth. And the temperature that can vary between 18 to 27 degrees Celsius, in general, bet it's between 23 to 24 degrees Celsius. Water vapor is controlled. What is not ideal yet is the level of CO2 inside, you know, the carbon dioxide inside the space, the space station because uh, we cannot ventilate the space station. No? So it is something that is, let's say, always present there, an amount of, um, let's say, CO2 that's not good for the health of the astronauts, and uh, it, can, it can have some impact in their uh, well-being. So for low, uh, low Earth orbit missions called LEO missions, uh, if I have the environment as I, I showed to you, and I set the scene to you, you know, that is basically very similar to the, what we have here on, here on Earth, then the scientists and the entrepreneurs, the business people in the area of uh, space science would have to concentrate in four aspects. First, microgravity, you know, how, does, how it affects the body and the anatomy and the, 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 the physiology of an, an astronaut in space. Radiation, because you are not as protected as we are here on Earth. We don't have the, the atmosphere protecting us, but we still have the Van Allen 
uh, belt protecting our um, astronauts in, in, in Earth's orbit. And remember that this Earth's orbit is around 400, kilom uh, 400 kilometers of altitude. So we are in between, let's say, these two layers of protections, our atmosphere and our magnetosphere. Uh, so we are a bit more protected than when you go to Mars or the Moon. We have the psychosocial aspects, what I call the mind in space. And you have uh, these um, uh, circadian rhythm disturbances. Uh, what is a circadian rhythm? Is the, 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 the biological clock that we have that, for example, makes us to feel awake in the morning and uh, tired and uh, sleep at night, for example, or that we are hungry about noon and that uh, you are um, more active during the afternoon than you are, for example, in the evenings. So this, is, this sets the, our clock to function over 24 hours. As I mentioned, the space station is about 400 kilometers in altitude. To keep this, um, this altitude and to be in orbit around the, the, the Earth, the, the speed, the velocity uh, of that uh, station should be 27,000 kilometers per hour, which gives in a, in a period of 24 hours 16 sunsets and 16 sunrises, which means that the astronauts have 16 days in 24 hours, which is too much you know, for your brain to understand it, for the brain to adapt, and it can have impacts on, on the sleep of the pattern of astronauts that in in, in fact, they sleep uh, not the, the, the preconized eight hours that would be ideal. They sleep about six hours uh, per night um, and uh, per 24 hours, I would say. And the quality of the sleep is also affected. So there are many reasons for us to be concerned about the circadian rhythm, because, you know, if you don't sleep well, you are aff it affects your performance, your mental ability and so on. If one day you return to the moon, no, you know that between 69 and 72, 12 men walked on the moon for, during the Apollo program, American Apollo program. And the, nowadays there is this plan to go back to the moon, to be, uh, let's say, living, having habitats on the moon, and uh, there will be a space station that will be built around the moon, you know, that will be orbiting the moon, called uh, the Gateway. So this Artemis program that wants us to get back to the moon is an international program. Uh, it, is a, it will pose different challenges to whatever we are in terms of um, uh, rela the, our relationship with the human space exploration. It's going to be uh, a, mu a much more, let's say, dedicated program to est establish the first colony, uh, ex extraterrestrial colony you know, that will be on the moon. So the, the, we need to deal with the, the, the environment of the moon. Now we are not on, uh, in the Earth's orbit. We are in another celestial body, our natural satellite. And we need to deal with the environment there, which has a very thin, basically no atmosphere. Uh, so there is no available oxygen, no water, no protection against the radiation or meteorites or uh, asteroids, so we have this exposure you know, to, to a very uh, open somehow environment. We have lots of dust, and this was one of the complaints of the astronauts of the Apollo program that after being on the moon, when they were coming back to Earth during microgravity, this dust could not sediment on, on, their, on the, 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 the soil, let's say, of the spacecraft because it was um, uh, floating. And if you have this, lots of uh, these dust particles floating, you, it can affect the instrument, uh, equipment. You know, it can damage this uh, equipment. We can uh, have uh, some dust coming to the eyes or nose or throat of the astronaut. So it's not very pleasant. Uh, so you need to, do, to deal with that as well when you are on the moon and when you are transiting from the moon back to Earth. And uh, what is good, in fact, in relation to the moon is that it is very close to us, our natural satellite that's about 300,000 kilometers from us, which, is, um, be, uh, which gives us the possibility of a basically real-time communication with one to two second delay, uh, which provides, let's say, the opportunity for doctors on the ground to be able to contact astronauts very easily in terms of uh, the 
to provide some telehealth care, for example. And of course, the moon is not just smaller than Earth. The mass of the moon is much smaller than we, what we have here on Earth. And then the gravitational force is also much, let's say, uh, small. So if we weigh 60 kilos here on Earth, you're going to weigh, let's say, 10 kilos on the moon. So it is a very quick way to lose weight. <laughs> And um, if you go to Mars one day, we have to deal with Mars uh, uh, environment, very, very low barometric pressure. The atmosphere is full of CO2, 96% of CO2. Temperature is very low, minus 60. Uh, we have hypogravity, which is one third of the gravity of Earth. So 60 kilos here will be 10 on the moon and 20 on Mars. So just a bit better than the moon but it's still hypogravity because it is below uh, the gravitational force of Earth. One huge issue, though, is the distance. It will vary between 55 and 400 million kilometers. And this will affect lots of things, including how astronauts will perceive our planet from Mars. Uh, here I have a picture on the, on the left, uh, top left corner. It is, uh, you can see this is a uh, point, you know, in the top one is Mars. So that's how we see Mars from Earth, and that's how we are going to see Earth from Mars, which means just a dot in space, which can have a very, very huge impact in terms of emotion, psychology, because suddenly everything that we have here, you know, in the minds of the astronauts, all the reference, all the history, of our planet, not just of our civilization, but the planet itself is going to become just a dot in space, which can be very disturbing. Uh, and also, you know, as you have the moon dust, we also have sand storms on Mars. So here is a picture of a real picture of Mars in June 2001. And then in July 2001, you can visually see the difference uh, being the one on the left without sand storm and on the right with a sandstorm that was basically covering the planet. And again, it can damage rovers, it can damage habitats or humans if they are outside and so on. Uh, so it is quite a, a scary thing. When we talk about understanding and researching and studying, you know, teaching about humans uh, in space, we need to consider two main aspects, I would say. First, if it is uh, if it is, um, a, this mission is a short-term mission or a long-term mission. A short-term mission, let's say a month, a couple of weeks, a month, two months, and a long-term mission, like six months, a year. And then you are going to be affected both in terms of your physiology, how you function, and your mental ability or mental uh, health. It will be affected in different ways. And that's very important when you try to understand and try to simulate also what happens to humans in space. And this, I can, we can divide this also in terms of a professional career. For example, if you are an academic, you work in a university or in an institute of research, you have, um, uh, you are not going to be able to, to perform long-term studies, like weeks or even days or months. You have to be confined to your lab for, um, basically hours, no? because you cannot have volunteers there for more than, let's say, 10 hours in a day, because the lab has to be closed at night. You cannot, you don't have the support for uh, giving, let's say, food to people uh, in, in, in spe specific types of simulations or to, um, you know, to have a toilet, special toilet for them to have a bath uh, in this and that, because it's a university, you know, you, you have labs, you don't have this facility, uh, this huge facility and support helping your study. If you are in a space agents, uh, on the other hand, you can have studies that can run for days, weeks, and even months. There are studies that simulate microgravities, microgravity, sorry, for um, 200 days. Oh, we cannot have that support uh, if you are in a universe. So even that can shape your career, shape what you are going to somehow develop in terms of hardware or software or technology to be applied to different types of research. And another important aspect is to consider men and women. 
let's say that roughly we have 600 astronauts or space travelers uh, that uh, explore the space, you know, the extraterrestrial environment, but uh, only 12% are women, which means that we know a lot about how uh, men behave in space, but not as much as how women behave in space. And we know, you know by <laughs> we know that we have uh, anatomic difference, we have physiological difference uh, between men and women. You also have uh, clinical expressions of different diseases. You no, know? some, uh, for example, you uh, women are more prone to have problems related to the immune system, for example. Uh, and men, of course, is more, let's say, has more bone mass and muscle mass. So there are many differences that can be affected, you know, um, uh, that, can, uh, that can make, uh, let's say, the response to an extraterrestrial environment very different between men and women. So in everything we study here on Earth, I'm very careful to always have two groups of volunteers. So a group of men, a group of women, that match in age or this or that, you know, depend on the study. But it's very important to have these two groups. Because one day, if you really go to the moon to have a base there and one day to have a, also a habitat on, on Mars, uh, and you are, let's say, basically living in space stations or hotels in space and so on, we have to, to uh, start understanding human reproduction in space and it's still a bit of a taboo in terms of sex in space, reproduction in space of humans. Some um, studies have been done with uh, uh, small animals like frogs and mice, but we need to better understand how, if we are, we are really capable of reproducing in space and, and uh, delivering health babies uh, on the moon one day. Again, in terms of uh, how you approach uh, space physiology and medicine, uh, in terms of a space mission, you can have a pre-flight, in-flight, and a post-flight situation. And this also can be related to your career path, you know, your, uh, the development of some technology uh, specifically for before the mission, during or after the mission, that, for example, for pre-mission, you have uh, um, to select, to train people, to familiarize them with um, uh, different equipment, uh, medical equipment, uh, as well as uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the functioning of um, uh, uh, the, the, the engineering behind the, the space station, for example, you know, to be able to repair or maintain equipment. When you are there, you, know, you have to be also adapted to, to, uh, to microgravity, as I mentioned before, and they're going to talk a bit about that, to the, the, the environment itself. And for that, we need lots of uh, uh, new devices, uh, new softwares, artificial intelligence, or communication to Earth, and so on. So it's a huge area for the development of uh, new process techniques, uh, equipment, and so on. And when you have the post-flight, you have to readapt the person, not just to the environment of Earth in terms of gravity, but also you have to readapt the person uh, mentally, emotionally, to their families, to their societies, to their professional life, because after a while, you know, you were, you, you were in space, you were, um, um, uh, you were in space, you were, let's say, uh, uh, living your dream, uh, and then you come back to Earth, and then suddenly everything is gone, and you have to, to deal with this, uh, uh, with this uh, situation you know, that sometimes is very very uh, difficult for people that went into space. So I divided, now I just want to give a brief overview of what happens to humans in space. And I divide space medicine uh, in space, uh, in, in the physiological and psychological change that will happen when you are in an extraterrestrial environment. What I also call operational medicine, which is more related to the logistics of the uh, space mission and I will get there and uh, clinical medicine, which is basically what happens uh, with an astronaut when they get sick in space. So it's not the expected physiological, emotional change that you are going to have because you are in this very different hostile environment, but something on top of that, that you are really sick. You have an infection, for example. So let's just um, 
try to understand a bit of this, what changes in our body, in our anatomy, in our physiology when you are in space. So what do we know about that? This is a chart that I like very much because each line, each, uh, it has a color and each, and each line represents a body system. And I just want you to pay attention. I know that most, most of you are not doctors or not in, not in the health area, so I'm not going to stress it too much, but just I want, I, want to make, uh, I want to make sure that you understand that different body systems will respond in different ways to this environment, this new environment. So the neurovestibular system, for example, that is the yellow line, it goes uh, very quickly, it reacts very quickly to microgravity and then adapts very quickly as well. Uh, if you see the red line, the cardiopulmonary system, it goes, it uh, adapts or it reacts um, much slower and then it reacts, uh, at, sorry, it reacts much slower and then it adapts much slower as well. And if you look at this, um, blue line, you can see that it never adapts, which is the bone mass. And the, the other line that's a bit, uh, bit bluish, a bit uh, uh, green bluish, uh, the lean body mass is, is related to the muscles. And you can see also that it, it's a continuous loss somehow, no? So there is no proper adaptation to microgravity environment. So you need to have what's called countermeasures to be applied to the astronauts to try to counterbalance all these issues that does not, uh, that, that don't adapt to microgravity. So very briefly then, some changes that are very well known. Space motion sickness, basically it's a conflict of information that your eyes and your, uh, in the system that is in your uh, ear, called vestibular system that gives you orientation, um, gives the, 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 these two systems, the visual system and the vestibular system, give different inputs to the brain. The eye saying, for example, oh, you are upside down because I can see that you are upside down. But the vestibular system that depends on gravity to work, as we are in microgravity, there is basically no effect of gravity. There is basically zero. You are, the vestibular system says, no, you are not upside down. And this conflict of information makes the person to feel sick. Like sometimes when you drive a car or you are in a, in a boat and then you feel uh, nausea, sometimes vomiting, uh, many times you feel not well, your performance is decreased, you sweat a bit, you feel fatigue. So this is uh, more or less what happens to the astronauts in the first three days of space flight and then it adapts and uh, in general it disappears. Not necessarily, but in general. In terms of the car's pulmonary system, it's quite interesting because imagine a bottle of water, you know, and then uh, if you just drink a bit of the, the water, you can see that it remains, let's say, uh, the liquid remains in the lower part of the bottle, like our blood here on Earth. If we stand up, you have more blood in our lower limbs than when we are, for example, lying down on a bed that we distribute the blood uh, a bit differently. But when you are in space, as there is no gravity acting on your body, the blood basically shifts upwards, goes from your lower body to your upper body, enlarging the heart, making your face a bit, let's say, rounded and uh, reddish. So it's called the puffy face. And because you are shifting the blood from your lower limbs upwards, you have what's called the bird legs. So here you can have, uh, you can see a face of two astronauts. So the left pictures of each one of them is before flight and during the flight is the right pictures. So you can see that they, they really change the shape of their face. But there are a series of different uh, uh, physiological adaptations. And then after seven, 10 days, your heart is smaller again, sometimes even smaller than before flight. You have less blood circulating because it adapts as it is the body sense that you have too much blood circulating because of this shift of blood. And then you, are, you enter this uh, cardiovascular say, adaptation to microgravity. The problem uh, happens when you return to Earth, you have less blood, you have a heart that's smaller, you have a different, a difficult to control blood pressure, and then you, are, uh, you can have what's called orthostatic intolerance, which means that you are intolerant to be in the standing position. You feel dizzy and you can 
faint. One of the main issues in space, believe it or not, is the the shape that you assume in space. You are what you are in a, what is called a, a semi-fetal position, because if I don't know if you can see the the lady in the back with a pink shirt. No, the, the, the legs are upward, they are up, you no, know, her arms are um, in front of her body. And so she, she has this type of, uh, let's say, this is the, 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 uh, the common position in space. And it comes because uh, one of the things that happens is that you change the shape of your colon. Your, your spine is, uh, instead of having the normal uh, curvatures, it becomes like one big curvature, like a D cur curvature. And it also increases, it elongates you now because you don't have the gravity basically um, this, the, you know, keeping you at the, the right height. You no, know? you have this uh, elongation of the spine. Uh, so all the, the soft tissue, like the discs between the, the, the bones or the, the, the muscles and tendons around the bones, ligaments, it basically distends and then you increase your height. That can be up to six to eight centimeters, but in general it's about four, five centimeters. And you have uh, something very common during this process is that you have back pain. So one of the most complaints of astronauts in space is back pain. And another one, as I mentioned before, is insomnia, or that they should sleep more than they do normally. And remember that chart that I showed that the bones, you are constantly losing mass in space. And that's very true, especially for the lower limbs. It concentrates the, the, uh, the loss of bone density, bone mass in the, from the pelvis down, from the hips down. And you can see here that even the heel bone you know, is, can be losing like 2% a month, which is an, uh, it's a lot of bone, uh, bone uh, loss. Normally, if you lose here on Earth, 1% a year is already concerning. But 2% a month, it's a lot. So it's really something that is very important for astronauts to, um, to, to take care of. You know, to, to, and for researchers here on Earth to find ways to try to protect the bones in space. Of course, it depends on the duration of exposures to microgravity, uh, if you exercise or not, which is one of the countermeasures that I'm going to mention later. And of course, there is always individual variation. The same happens to the muscles, especially the muscles from the abdomen down. Uh, we have a, an atrophy of these muscles, about 13 to 20 percent, and a change in the type of fibers that you have, because uh, the, the, the slow to eat uh, endurance fibers that you use here on Earth to keep ourselves against gravity so we can be in the standing position, for example, it's called type 1 fi fibers, it changes to a fast twitch type of fibers. That's the type two fibers. So this, uh, it's much more important, for example, in space, is for you to move around f fast or to react fast, because even in a, in a situation of an emergency, you have to do uh, lots of stuff at the same time. And uh, the endurance fibers, the, the one that are for standing here on Earth, are not that important in space anymore. You don't do that, you don't stand in space anymore. Um, so uh, the, the, there is a decrease in the power, strength, fiber size, mass, so the muscle atrophy, which is also, uh, as the, for the bones, it's also related to the duration of exposure to microgravity, the exercise countermeasures, as I mentioned, exercise, um, the, that I'm, uh, I will explain a bit later, and individual variations. I just bring this slide because it is important for you to understand that you know, the, the, the whole, let's say, the, the, that nowadays we don't just study the, the big body systems, you know, the, like cardiovascular system or the, the muscle system or the uh, neural vestibular system. You know, the systems that I just briefly presented to you, but we can also study the cells in space, stem cells in space. You can study virus in space. You can study genetics in space and this was one of the uh, one, it was the first study of NASA using two astronauts that had uh, uh, missions before you know but the one stayed here on earth 
and that other one went into space. So Scott Kelly went into space, Mark was here on Earth, and they then compare uh, several aspects of their physiology and their response to vaccines, for example, uh, the immune system reactions to micrograft and so on. And uh, here, remember that I mentioned uh, that individual variation for the bone loss and muscle atrophy. Here, the individual variation is basically known because you have the same genetics. They are um, twins. So it's called the twin study. It's just, I'm just bringing that because it, I think that's a good example of how broad it is becoming the, the area of space, physiology, medicine, or the health area in space. It's not just medicine, medicine, or the clinical medicine, but it's also physiology, nutrition, genetics, pharmacy, psychology, and so on. In terms of um, countermeasures, as I mentioned, for the body, there are three main types of exercise device in space. One is the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, ARAD. There is a treadmill and a cycle ergometer. Of course, they are adapted to be used in microgravity. And this ARAD is a very important one because it substitutes what here we do when you go to the gym, no? and then you do like you know, uh, weights to you know, make the body stronger. Uh, and this in space is, of course, adapted as you don't have gravity. And then you use this resistance to your movement in a way to preserve, let's say, the bones and the muscles uh, that you have. And it has worked very well. In terms of the mind in space, which is a very interesting area of uh, psychology and psychiatry, we astronauts have to deal with isolation, confinement, lack of references, complete lack of references. No? Uh, sometimes they are... Um, uh, they complain that they are overloaded. Sometimes they have moments of monotony. Uh, there are some cases of depression. Let me talk about that a bit later. As I mentioned before, insomnia. We need to remember that nowadays we have three, four, five, six astronauts sometimes in a space mission, in a spa at the space station. And then we have people uh, from uh, different uh, backgrounds, countries, language, culture. So it's um, it's a mix you now that could even gender you know, men and women together. So sometimes it can create some communication issues because of this crew diversity, which is, in my opinion, very welcome. But there are some issues that we need to work. And then there are space psychologists and space psychiatrists that dedicate themselves to improve, let's say, uh, or create countermeasures and so on for the well-being or, or the mental well-being of astronauts in space. It is also, of course, um, there is, uh, besides micrograph that you have to do all the time, it is also a kind of uh, hostile environment because of other uh, reasons, other risks like radiation. We know that radiation has an effect on the brain. Uh, studies with mice have uh, shown that they, they can have cognition issues which can affect, of course, your performance. You know, if you have cognition issues, you have a lack of attention or memory, and then it can uh, be very detrimental for your mission. As we have uh, countermeasures for the body, you know, as I just showed very briefly, the exercise that they perform in a space mission with that three equipment, we also have um, ways to try to make them um, let's say, feel better uh, in terms of their emotions. So socialization, entertainment, is they are very important. Like to play music in space, to have a meal with your friends, your colleagues of uh, a mission, to play a game that you can play with a colleague at the ISS, or you can play with someone here on Earth that's possible nowadays. Uh, ISA has built this, um, it's called cup Cupola, which is this window that can be used for astronauts to relax, to talk to their families, is more like say private, or you can um, take pictures of Earth and thing, uh, things like that. You know. So this is a, a way to compensate for the problems in space in terms of psychology. Nowadays, even yoga, meditation, mindfulness are being added to, to the uh, schedule of astronauts. And, I don't know if you are aware, but very soon, I think that the next couple of years, uh, India is going to send their four 
Vyomonauts into space, and because yoga started in India, I think that it is something that they, with time, they will bring more of their culture and their knowledge about this, let's say, ways to improve the well-being of people using these methods. Um, India will become the fourth country that would be able to send people into space. Uh, the first one was Russia, then States, then China, and now India is coming in. The second area that I would like just to uh, chat about a bit is operational medicine, which, as I said, is related to the logistics of a space flight that can affect your well-being and health because it's related to how you sleep, how you prepare and perform an extravehicular activity. It's called EVA, you now the abbreviation. As it's when you uh, step out of the space station, let's say, and have to work outside. You now and then you have this space suit and everything that's related to that in terms of physical and mental uh, skills and the training. So just to show you here how astronauts sleep in space and, and one of the reasons that uh, it's very difficult to, to really relax and sleep well and have a good uh, quality of sleep because they are, as you can see, um, uh, sometimes they have no privacy, there are always noise and uh, a bit of you know, light uh, 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 over there, so it is you have to basically cover your eyes, you are in a sleeping bag floating, or you are sleeping in the upright position. So there is all this absence of familiar uh, proprioceptive uh, cues, which is um, prop proprioception is, how uh, how can I explain? For example, when you leave home and you just uh, put your glasses on or your watch on your wrist, uh, and then you basically, you forget that it's there. Now, the, first you have this uh, pressure, this mechanical, let's say, uh, stimulus, and then suddenly it, it is gone. You know? and, uh, and in space, it is, it is never there. You know? Things don't touch you. you, you, you the way that your uh, perception of your body in space changes because you don't have the gravity to signalize what, uh, how you are moving, basically and what is in contact with your body. Space meals, very important, it evolved a lot, you know, and uh, it also is very much related to the health of astronauts in space nowadays. We know that space nutrition is an area of uh, huge interest, especially now that you are talking about space tourism, hotels in space, and when they are habitat on, on the moon, for example, and it evolved a lot, you know, if you consider that uh, in the beginning, it was like a toothpaste, you no, know, with food inside, not toothpaste, though, no, it's not a tube of, like a tube of toothpaste with food inside. And now you have uh, fruits, you have uh, different ways to preserve and present the meals to astronauts. And it's quite interesting to see that uh, exercise and diet and uh, supplements of, for example, v uh, vitamin, vitamin D, 800 uh, units, uh, international units uh, per day, could give the astronauts a better bone density, uh, preserve it. After, I say, four to six months in space, you can see that this is from 2012, the first time that you could see a real preservation of bone mass in space. So it is, it is feasible, it is achievable. You now, if you combine diet with some medication and exercise, so this operational aspects of a mission that will provide a better health to astronauts. Clinical medicine, I would add here a bit of the risks related to radiation. Now that is very uh, important nowadays because one day in space can be like a year here on Earth in terms of exposure to radiation. So to study uh, ways to protect the astronauts, either using uh, uh, medication that, that could, could be uh, protective against radiation, the effects of radiation, or to somehow um, shield the place, shield the, the, the spacecraft, which is quite difficult because otherwise they would have done that already, because it, you have to protect the, the, the body to the exposure you know, to radiation, because radiation from space, especially deep space, so when we are not in between the uh, Earth's atmosphere and the mag uh, magnetospheres, that is the Van Allen uh, belt, you know, that when you are going to the moon or to Mars in deep space, you are going to have lots of radiation affecting your body, and then it can cause 
problems in, uh, problems that are acute problems no that could be that could put in danger the the the, the life of an astronaut or chronic problems even after the mission to have issues related to your lungs your heart you no know, changing your arteries because of this uh, the, 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 or your brain because of the effect of radiation. So just for you to have an idea, you know, uh, uh, here on Earth, we can have uh, uh, the, the first bar there is the annual cosmic radiation at sea level, so very low, as you can see, 0.5, more or less, millisieverts. But if you go to Mars, 500 days is about 100 and something millisieverts, 150, or no, no, 500, sorry, Millisievert. So it is a lot of difference between your exposure here to your exposure in a trip to Mars. That's just 500 days. No, it's, it's less than a year. So it is uh, quite a, um, a concern. And how to really protect the, 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 the body of the astronauts and avoid them to have um, later on diseases related to the exposure of the radiation, including cancers or or as I mentioned, cardiopulmonary issues, neurological issues, and so on. In terms of space medicine, again, or the clinical medicine that I mentioned, uh, here it's a very interesting chart, uh, a table that shows you the uh, 17 years of astronauts, U.S. astronauts during the space program, the shuttle space program that was from 81, as I mentioned before, 12 April 81 to January 1998. And then you can see more or less the distribution of the clinical issues. No, again, I'm not talking here about the uh, adaptation of our physiology and our psychology to space, but diseases that can come on top of that, of the digestive system or injuries or skin or the respiratory system or infectious diseases. And then you can see that doctors can be of some help here from Earth, you no, know, trying to really uh, identifying or uh, helping astronauts during their uh, space missions because they will get sick some point in time, especially in long-term missions. No? Uh, this is another table showing seven astronauts, uh, American astronauts that participate in the um, uh, missions at the Mir space station, which was a Russian uh, space station from 95 to 98, so three years. And again, you have all you know, these problems with um, skin, muscle skeletal, and so on. But I just call the attention here and the highlight there, the psychi psychiatric aspect that uh, in general is related to depression. So uh, it's just a sample. You know, more astronauts have referred um, moments of monotony and depression during, uh, uh, especially, I would say, during long-term missions, you know, after being in space for four months, six months, eight months, and they, they feel that, um, you know, that everything is a bit, like say, low. No, it's not uncommon to have that. In, in general, when you are doing something new, in, at first you are very excited, you are very, you know, uh, lots of expectations. And when you are, it's, it's close to the end of that uh, period, it could be even a holiday, you know, you feel a bit nostalgic, you feel a bit, uh, uh, sometimes you euphoric that you are going back, you are going to see your family or friends again and so on but in between these two moments you have this sometimes you have this low period of emotions that uh, are a bit like um, uh, close to depression or, or at least more like a slow uh, emotion or a, 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 a moment of a, 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 how, how can i say it's not depression itself but it is that you feel a bit low no, in your heart. So we, this is what we know. No, so what is needed now? Because we we uh, we can conclude that every single cell in our body is affected by the environment of space. The body systems are affected. You have to deal with the diet and uh, uh, and exercise and other countermeasures to try to uh, keep yourself you no know, um, healthy during the mission and after the mission when you return to Earth. So first, medical training, very important. You know, the astronauts have to be trained to first to understand this adaptation to space, plus to identify if something is not going on uh, correctly, right? So there is something, some uh, clinical disease, disease, sorry, clinical situation coming 
uh, and uh, present itself could, could be, as I said, an infection, could be a problem of your digestive system and so on. So you need to be trained to perform some minor um, medical procedures and also to collect data, properly collect data to send medical data to the ground. So you can see uh, a guy there practicing uh, how to collect the data to send to the ground. It is very, very important that it happens because um, otherwise you, you might not have a, a doctor on board. You have to remember that out of the 600 astronauts, uh, roughly that we, that we have, ab about a less than 10%, I mean, that's 8% are doctors. So it is not a very popular profession in this, uh, uh, in this situation. I, I believe that to, to go to the moon and to go to Mars, you're going to have doctors on board, but not necessarily in a mission uh, around, the, around the Earth. So telemedicine is uh, used not just during, but also after the missions. So nowadays it is uh, is uh, published that in 2017, so it's quite recent that they start using telemedicine uh, immediately after landing, which is very important for astronauts because they, as we could see, there are huge changes in our physiology, anatomy and so on. So when you come back to Earth, you need to be um, uh, rescued somehow, you know, in, in the sense that you need to be uh, evaluated immediately to to make sure that you are healthy enough to deal with the the environment here on Earth. When you are in space, telemedicine is also used, and it is um, as I mentioned, if you are a 400 kilometer from um, from Earth, from the sea level, at, at 27,000 kilometers per hour, we have one orbit every 90 minutes. Remember that I mentioned that you have 16 sunsets and 16 sunrise in 24 hours. But it has the advantage of allowing a real-time communication, which means that we can medically monitor monitoring the astronauts on board of the ISS and then collect data, medical data at re regular intervals. We can support them during medical emergencies and also observe the physiological, psychological changes that are happening during a mission. If you are going to Mars one day, though, remember that you are going to be like six months in microgravity then you have to deal with all that environment of Mars that we talked about before, uh, especially hypergravity, radiation, social and, as, and uh, emotion, emotional and psychiatric aspects during the trip and when you arrive on Mars. So you might get there and are, might be a very different person. You should be a very different person after being traveling you know, away from Earth uh, for, uh, for about six months. But then you are going to have this huge distance that, remember that I mentioned, between 55, uh, roughly 55 to 400 million kilometers, which will affect the communication. So you are going to have delays of three minutes to one side, three minutes to another side, uh, or 22 minutes each side. So solutions for that, you need to create, be very creative and, and improve our technology of how to support astronauts during this type of missions. So creating tools in space is one method, and it's very good because you can just um, the, um, uh, print you know, something that is for your, um, could be a dental uh, tool, or you can be a, a medical tool that you need for whatever is uh, presenting there. Again, the astronaut training to collect data and to perform some medical um, uh, um, procedures. But I, I believe that we need to really improve our um, our way to to make them very autonomous, very independent from Earth. You no, know? we cannot rely on telemedicine, especially if you, one day we go to Mars because of the distance. So you need to have very sophisticated algorithms, artificial intelligence, to use robots to help with the diagnose, management, treatment of diseases in space. Could be mental problems, could be physical problems, but we need to have uh, the support of uh, robo robots as doctors with very sophisticated uh, AI inside. Another way to do that, it was uh, published very recently, it is uh, to use a hibernation you know, for long space missions, not just to make sure that the astronauts are not, let's say, uh, stressed and exposed you know, consciously to uh, to the environment of space, the trip itself, but also uh, it can save lots of um, 
time in terms of uh, supplies, you know, like uh, um, uh, oxygen or, or, or water or uh, how to deal with the waste or stress. You know? So it's a way to try to compensate, you know, to, to, um, to provide, let's say, this a state of, of uh, very low metabolism that then you don't need much. You are in this uh, in a state of co almost a coma, you no. Know? But uh, animals uh, are used to do that. Bears, as you know, but we are not designed for that. So I still, I'm not still. Uh, I, I want to read more about hibernation for astronauts because I'm really it's a bit quite new for me in terms of uh, the logistics of that. You no. Know? And as I mentioned, we have new countries coming in. You no, know, from uh, like India, Japan, China. We have the space tourism that what what this chart shows here is that we are changing uh, the money, the, the research, the activities, space activities are changing from governments uh, to, to the, or the, the traditional governments to other governments and also to the um, space tourism. And the space tourism will bring a very, very different and very important uh, change uh, of how we doctors, we scientists, uh, are, are dealing with uh, people that travel into space because still now we select, train these people. They are very healthy. They are uh, in a kind of age, age range. There was just one astronaut that was 77 years old, John Glenn, that w went into space um, as an old man, let's say, to see what could happen to them, to him in, a, in, a, in, the, uh, in microgravity. But it was an exception. Normally, it is uh, people that are very fit, very healthy, not taking medication, with no chronic diseases. And now we are going to have these people that are less fit candidates. They are possibly sick. They are maybe taking some medication. They are older. And if you are famous and rich, you pay and you go. And that's uh, something that will change completely the, the, our, um, let's say, relationship with people that go into space, which will require more uh, extra care, maybe more equipment to monitor them, maybe different types of uh, um, uh, softwares or, or device, medical device and so on to take care of these uh, people. Could be children, could be someone that is very old, like we just had uh, uh, the Captain Kirk from uh, uh, going to the Star Trek, for in, uh, going for a couple of minutes into microgravity through the blue orange. And here you have a picture of uh, Steve Hawking one of uh, the famous British astrophysicists, uh, basically facing microgravity in a parabolic flight, which is a, an airplane that goes up and down, describing pa parabolas in, 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 in space, in, in, the, in the atmosphere, you know, it's an airplane, uh, but then you have periods of microgravity. And because he was famous enough, he was then invited <coughs> to participate in a parabolic flight, although he could not speak by himself or move by himself properly. So it was a kind of a very risk situation. Space tourism, they did not start with them uh, nowadays. It started in 2001 with Space Adventure that took billionaires you know, at the cost of 20 to 40 million dollars to the ISS. But nowadays you have these three companies that want to make it very popular, uh, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX and Blue Orange trying to make it more popular. And even a construction of a space hotel is starting. It's starting next month, I believe. So this will be a complete, again, different scenario. Now we are going to have like 400 people <laughs> in space. That's not uh, something that I can envisage, you know, how, how to take care, how to make sure that they are safe and healthy during their uh, holiday in, uh, in Earth's orbit. But uh, I think that our final message is that technology and knowledge transfer is very important. Because sometimes we develop stuff that will for space, that we stay in space, or things that we develop here on Earth, that we stay here on Earth. But we have also this possibility of uh, 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 import from space technology and knowledge that will be uh, very helpful to different areas of science here on Earth. And then here you have just an example. You now, since 1976, you now more than 40 years, NASA have. Um, uh, let's say classify classified the the spin-offs or you know, the benefits of exploring space in different areas, of course, including health and medicine. 
and just some examples here, you know, in the areas of telemedicine, e-health, or the better understand of human psychology, physiology, medicine, and other health-related areas, development of medical equipment and device, or the, the health of applications of different softwares, AR, XAR, VR, um, disease investigation and treatment. You remember that you are, space is a very unique type of lab. You can study many different um, uh, things there, not just humans, but animals, plants, virus, bacteria, and then try to develop some uh, a better understanding of all that that can be imported here on Earth. Exercise and space countermeasures, very important for uh, the, uh, not just for astronauts in space, but uh, for the rehabilitation of um, uh, patients here on Earth that, let's say, had an accident or suffered a stroke, and then you can apply this knowledge and this technology to them. Genetics and aging, very important. You now I just showed you the twin study. And of course, the development of uh, robonauts, robots as doctors that can easily be applied in many situations, scenarios, medical scenarios here on Earth. Okay, this was my lecture. I hope you have enjoyed it. I'm just returning here. Stop sharing. And I will be back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture. It was uh, great to learn about a very uh, all overview on the opportunities, the challenges going to the space. Uh, I'll give my thoughts on this. Uh, lots of uh, uh, problems that you mentioned, such as insomnia, back pain, depression. Uh, it looks like there are uh, some kinds of uh, disease that we are facing now, uh, uh, post-COVID, during COVID and post-COVID. So uh, maybe this is a good time for us to be trained. Uh, so I would like to hear your comments on that. Also, you mentioned telemedicine. Uh, so it's something, uh, technology that uh, we are developing and executing a lot now. So uh, there are things that we can apply in the space in the future. So I would like to hear from you on uh, your comments on, you know, what we can do here to uh, to better prepare for the space, which is not something unreasonable. It's something that is possible in the future. So what 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 can we do to better prepare? Well, I think that uh, we have now, as I was mentioning, many different challenges you now that you need to prepare, and you need to prepare for all of them. You know? like the space tourism or, or longer stay on Earth's orbit and uh, re return to the moon and to missions to Mars. They are very different projects and you need to be prepared for that. And I believe that uh, we need to make them very autonomous. You know, we cannot, they, they have to, we have to cut this umbilical cord with our planet because it will be um, long, longer missions or, or in deep, spa deep space missions and they, that's, that's the key point. The, the astronauts must be as autonomous as possible for you know, to keep their uh, health and well-being in space. So I believe that uh, we need to concentrate in, in devices, in softwares, uh, as I said, in artificial intelligence and uh, even, I don't know, adapted clothes, things that could be used for them to monitor themselves, to be able to be independent uh, of uh, you know, the the mission control on Earth to to handle situations. Uh, so I think that maybe for space tourism, we are still because it's going to be basically in the Earth's orbit. We can still use lots of telehealth and telemedicine. But uh, for other missions, we need to prepare them, not us, but prepare them to be um, autonomous in their medical care. But it is a lot of uh, investment in terms of devices and softwares and uh, that can be very, very useful, useful for us here on Earth. Imagine in a war, in remote areas, in disaster areas, in, uh, in mountain expeditions, in deserts, in Antarctica, in the Arctic, all these areas of Earth that uh, we have uh, people living and exploring, and at the same time we need to keep them healthy, you know? 
Thank you. Yeah, you're right. That is all. I will uh, invite uh, one of our participants, Andre. He asked the question and I asked him to address the question directly to you, OK, on the audio. So Andre, you can turn on your audio, your microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. So okay. Andre speaks from Sao Paulo, but he can briefly introduce himself and and ask your question to Professor Thais. Okay, thank you very much for invitation, the Sue for organization, Thais for your presentation. Very interesting. Always nice to hear about, uh, let's say, the human barriers. And uh, my question is, I was very impressed in 2012 when Felix Baumgartner jumped from the space. Uh, probably you are familiar with this. Yeah, I saw that. I saw the, the news, yeah. I saw, yeah. never read something scientific about it, but I, I, I saw in the news. Okay, uh, as far as I know, he has the dealt with some barriers, uh, the free jump fall from the space uh, and it was safe. How do you see that uh, for human evolution for from from your perspective, from your work? What did it meant for humanity? If you can uh, tell us a few thoughts about this, please. Well, I think that not just him, though, no, not just this experience, but every everyone that uh, over years and years have uh, push the, 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 the envelope you know, somehow. They have uh, so they've risked their, their lives uh, to perform an activity uh, that would be uh, that would be a new one. You know? I think that it is very uh, it is risky. You no, know? they should they know that. But it is important for us in terms of science scientists because we can see that well it is possible. We it is feasible. Uh, as I mentioned, when Gagarin went into space in 1961, there was this huge lack of knowledge. And then suddenly he, wa he was in space, he was in microgravity, he was exposed to radiation, he came back uh, alive you know, and, and safe. So I think that it is, um, or the men that step on the moon. So we have lots of these people that really, uh, uh, by exploring, by, by taking the risks, they enlarge you know somehow our knowledge about ourselves and I think that's very important but it's very risk so we need to make sure that um, people don't start jumping or <laughs> or trying uh, <laughs> something very uh, peculiar you know in terms of adventures to try to prove a point because it, they can die you know they can or they can damage themselves for life you know so it is it's risky but it is admirable Thank you, Professor yes. Tyson. Thank you, Andre, for your question. You want to finalize? Go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, for reply. It's risky, of course. I can I can only imagine that. Since it's been ten years from this jump, do you maybe know what's going on now? Any any new things planned? Uh, how do you see that? No, I ha I haven't seen any any other news about jumpings. No. But I think I've seen news about people, you know, with different uh, suits that are that are like small rockets. They they that they are flying. You no, know? uh, I don't know if you have seen that. It is not jumping, but it's flying without an airplane, without a balloon, nothing. It's just the person in this special suit just flying and going up and down. And so I think that it might become another means, uh, maybe of transportation. Know, leaving home, take your suit and go to work by by air. You no know? <laughs> wing, wing suits. Yeah, kind of wing suits. Yeah, with uh, yeah. the yeah. so uh, I think that this is even more more useful, let's say, because I, I, I sometimes science and I, I'm a believer of that. You should do science for the science itself. Does not matter if you can see the application of that knowledge or technology that you are developing, but it is science per science because you never know what it can it can open doors no so maybe jumping from an altitude of x uh, feet will give us some point you know, at some point in time some some knowledge that will be important uh, some but i also think that because we are limited in terms of time and resources on earth it is very important when you think about a protocol or a study 
to have an application of that for a, for a more, let's say, uh, not just for astronauts, let's say, that a small number of people, but um, for the globe, uh, for, 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 for the society somehow. I think it's very important to have this in mind. And I, I, always, I was always very careful when I was uh, trying to uh, answer a question in science to have a protocol that somehow I could benefit uh, humanity in a way. That's why I have like seven patents, because I was always trying to get something for us here on Earth. Although, as I said many times, you should invest in science just for science. Don't think about anything else, because if you have an intuition there, there is a way that you should pursue. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, Thais, I have um, two questions and you can just elaborate, OK? So the first one is uh, uh, you, you mentioned the food and beverage, uh, food that we need to bring to the space. So I'm a lover, coffee lover. We talked about it when I was in London. So uh, can you can you explain uh, in illustrative way how would be the, the, the eating style? Like how can we have a coffee or eat bread? I yeah, no, it, it, as I said, it evolved a lot. Now, nowadays, you have a, a huge area called nutri space nutrition that deals with the selection, preparation, storage, and even how to display the, the, the food to astronauts. So these four topics are very important. How to preserve the food in space, how to deal with the waste. And nowadays, you, you can even try to um, to choose the food that you prefer. Not that, can, that, not that you can choose everything. Now, there are some rules and regulations that, that the space agents impose, and you have to eat this and that in that precise day or that precise time of the day. But you, can, you, have, you are more, more flexible. And, um, and uh, uh, you have to adapt, you know, the, you have to design uh, the, the, the trays or the, the, the way that you present the food and the cutlery and the, let's say, the mugs and things, you have to adapt that to microgravity because you cannot just pour the coffee in a <laughs> on a mug and then drink it. In fact, there was an astronaut, a very smart one, that wanted to drink coffee doing the, the, this movement here. You know, for him, it was important. It was part of this, uh, this uh, ritual, let's say. And then he developed and he painted that a mug that was possible to be used in microgravity because normally you have these uh, bags you no know, like uh, like uh, small bags with a straw that is also adapted for for the liquid when you, know, you open and close the straw to drink the liquid but talking about coffee specifically it's very oh, well it's um, it's um, consumed by by astronauts in, in large scale in space and when i was doing one of my parabolic flights I did two campaigns with ESA. <laughs> uh, there was an experiment with coffee being prepared. Uh, you, they were trying to develop a kind of coffee machine for space. And um, I remember that because it exploded, uh, something went wrong. And then you had this uh, coffee floating around. We had to stop the flights to clean up the airplane so it could continue without any harm for the cough to come to our eyes or, or throat or nose. <laughs> No, it is. Um, yeah, it is a very important area because, especially for space tourism and for habitats on the moon and trips to Mars, food is it, food is like a medication. No, it keeps you well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was the first question, and the second question that I have is about uh, about the your story because before I prepare this. While I was preparing this webinar, I was reading about uh, what you have written and the interview you have gave, given and uh, your personal story on, until you became uh, academic and, and especially expert in this area was very impressive. So uh, can you tell the audience, uh, you know, what was the big motivation for you to become what you, you be became? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I don't know the answers, no, completely, because when uh, my mother says I talk about space since I was like four years old, about, and that I was fascinated by space during my childhood. I, everything was space related. Uh, I had uh, telescopes, I had this and that, and 
everything was astronomy, astrophysics, and uh, but then when I was about, I started my university uh, medical school when I was uh, 15, 15, 16 years old. So I was quite young, and um, uh, at that time, at least to be an astronomer, it was in a firm that everybody was a lawyer. <laughs> It was like, oh, you, how can you work one day in astronomy? It's going to be difficult and this and that. So um, I decided to, to study medicine. And during my medical school, I found out that there was this opportunity to connect my passion, which was space, and um, and my profession, which was medicine. So I, comp I merged the two in space medicine or space physiology, however you want to call it, or space life science, even they some call it space life science. And then I tried to create a career, you know, doing my master's degree in the States in aerospace medicine, a PhD here in London at King's College in space physiology. I worked in a space agency in Germany, uh, Cologne, for a while, for three years about. And, uh, and then I decided to dedicate my life to to teach and to research about space uh, or humans in space or human space exploration, as I call. Um, and I somehow I was very successful against the, the predictions of my family. I was able to progress in my career, to support myself financially, to travel a lot, to meet many people, to make many friends. And one thing that I realized because I am Brazilian is that um, space uh, science, especially this area that I, I know more about because it's my, my, my expertise in you know, human space exploration, is confined in, in several, in, in few countries. You know? uh, it's expanding now, as I showed, to other countries, but it's still very much confined in a, you know, less than a, a 10 countries. So that's why one of the reasons that I created establishing of space was to make uh, it's more popular it, to give the opportunity to several countries I, where I know that are people like me that have this passion for space and human space exploration, to have the opportunity to learn about it, to research about it. So that's why we have so many projects in outreach and education under the umbrella of um, Nov Space. So please visit the site if you have the time, novspace.org, go what we do. We can see who we are, the team, the board of advisors, our partners and friends, uh, which are companies, associations, so on, and all the projects that you have for outreach, for education and um, and research and innovation. It's a beautiful journey. So we have two minutes uh, before we finalize our webinar. I just want to ask you a question. Uh, actually, we have two questions, so I'll just read and you can answer those questions. And I will ask you to make your final comments final closing before we finish the webinar. So the first question uh, that came from the question that came from Sergio is uh, what company develops the fitness equipment to space to to body um, to body exercise machines for the space? That's the question. Uh, another question from Christina is uh, so, Thais, thank you for the presentation. So, uh, my son is studying space engineering in um, Politecnico di Milano. Can you send me your contact for further discussion? Oh, yes, please. Uh, so, we can send my email to her. Uh, okay. No problem. And um, which was the question? Uh, what company develops the fitness ah, equipment? The companies, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I don't think that they are commercial products because I think that they are co some they have to be adapted now the treadmill I, I mean that I think that you are talking about the red treadmill and the psychoergometer because they have to be adapted in terms of size and, and shape and so on and all the straps that you need to have I think that NASA works with um, a company no, I don't believe there's a company maybe they have the engineers they are doing that by themselves I'm not sure. It's a good question, in fact, but I'm not sure. What I think in my mind is that for space tourism, we need to have new equipment for that, because these equipment are too big, you no, know, to to fit. Um, especially the A red, you know, it's very bulky, very. So we need to adapt that. So it's a, as I as I said, you no, know, the space tourism will open 
uh, opportunities for us as doctors and space life science scientists to understand more about diseases in space, medication in space, and so on. But uh, we'll also create a huge uh, area of research and the technology development for new software equipment and and uh, hardware devices, uh, telecommunication, uh, artificial intelligence, so on. Because as I said, we are going to have uh, ordinary people, let's say, not selected and trained people in going to space. That's great, uh, Thais. So, yeah, finally we have reached our goal. Uh, so I would like to thank you so much for your presentation and, and interaction with our audience. We learned a lot. I've got so many messages here uh, saying congratulations to you. Would you like to give your final um, closed closing comments to our audience? Uh, we are recording this webinar. We are going to uh, make this available on our social media and the channel. Okay. Okay. No, that's that's wonderful. No, I I, I want to thank again for the opportunity. I hope uh, the public that is here uh, have enjoyed the presentation. I, I know that you don't have uh, this medical background or, or a space background, maybe I don't know, but then I try to make it more accessible to you, you know, you know using um, a more, let's say, general uh, terms and not very medical and boring professional terms. Uh, I hope you you spread the word, word you know, that's, that's my main goal, that wherever you are, if you want uh, more webinars or if you want to uh, somehow collaborate with me through Innova Space, it will be wonderful to have you on board and um, and develop maybe new equipment or have ideas or educational projects, outreach projects for the schools. Uh, something very important, outreach projects are completely for free because I don't want schools or, or kids or to pay for that. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so it is also an opportunity for, for um, schools to join Novi Space programs and uh, and have more, say, somehow more knowledge about humans in space. So this is the invitation that I would like to extend to, to the audience that so that we can support your continuous work. And I think this is very educational, even for the parents who are uh, raising the future generation. I know that you have beautiful uh, educational project for the kids, but let's extend this project to the parents, to the adults, OK? And so, guys, thank you so much you, uh, for your patience for one hour and 30 minutes. Um, have a great uh, carnival season and <laughs> enjoy the weekend. And Professor Thais, uh, again, thank you so much for your contribution. So let's keep in touch, OK? And once we have this webinar recorded, I'm going to share with you and uh, make this available on social media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.